Social justice crusader, my goodness. Um, thank you for the invite. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about a universal human experience, uncertainty. To situate you a little bit in this experience, I'm going to start with a story of a 12-year-old boy. Um, this boy is uh, in Beirut, Lebanon. It's uh, wartime. And uh, there are missiles uh, by air, missiles from the ground. Um, a missile falls about 100 feet from uh, their apartment. And they're in an apartment building, about 100 feet from their apartment, a missile falls. Um, this boy's parents hurry, um, run down to the second floor. See, there's no basement in most of the buildings in, in Beirut. And so uh, the best thing you can do is go to the floor that has the least number of windows and hope for the best. So that's what they do. They run down to the second floor. This is something they're relatively used to. Um, there's about 15 people huddled there. It's an area of about 15 by 6. And they sit there waiting. Now, one of the most vivid aspects of this boy's story are the sounds. So, the sounds he hears while they're there on the second floor, the delays of the missiles, not knowing when the next missile is going to hit them, where it's going to fall, what's going to happen to them. The sounds are the primary part of the story. Now I asked him, what, you know, what were some of the most, the, the, the most vivid things beyond the sounds? And he said three things. The first was the sounds of this crying child whose mom and dad had to run upstairs to get something from their house. And the, the child cried, he's a 12 year old, he said, child cried, we're all gonna die, we're all gonna die. And he said that fear rippled through that second uh, floor landing. The second thing that he remembered vividly was hoping, praying, that if the missile were to hit their building, that his parents and his sister would not die, that he would not see them die. This is a 12-year-old kid speaking. And the third, by far the most vivid experience of it all, is the unknown. Uncertainty. Uncertainty about when this was going to fall, where this was going to fall, when they were going to be next. Now, this is a story of a very vivid story of someone in wartime, and you're thinking, okay, this is wartime, this is an intensity of this experience that certainly we're not going to hopefully experience. But what I'm telling you is actually, while people in wartime experience very intense uncertainties, we all, at various points in our lives, experience uncertainties with the same degree of intensity as this 12-year-old boy. Hopefully they're different. Hopefully they're not bombs. But unfortunately, they're going to be just as intense. The mind registers it in the same way. Our body responds in the same way. It could be a parent who's dying, who we don't know with how long they're going to survive. It could be an illness diagnosis, where we don't know what's going to happen to us, how long we're going to survive. It could be something not health-related. It could be a relationship. Does this person care for me? This is someone I care for a lot. Uncertainty about just caring takes a tremendous toll on us sometimes. It could be a variety, it could be your career, it could be your job, it could be what I'm going to do you know, a few days from now, things that are very important to you that we think about a lot, that have an intensity to our experience that absolutely affect us in ways very similar to the sorts of experiences of the story I started off with. Now, besides our own personal experience with uncertainty, one of the things, one of the ways we sort of understand uncertainty is through the media. In fact, um, a, uh, a, an analysis of, um, uh, of, of newspapers with headlines of uncertainty shows that we, ha we get about 100 stories every month with uncertainty in the title. So uncertainty is all around us. Now what I did is I, showed you, I, I chose two headlines or related stories in the last month related to uncertainty. The first is um, a, uh, a story about a recent earthquake uh, well, the story was, was recent, but it was a, a, an earthquake from a few months ago, from 2011, in New Zealand. 
Now, what you'll see here, the story is about this, this uh, elderly couple. It's a very, it's a heartwarming story if you read the whole thing. Um, the, the wife couldn't reach the husband, 95-year-old uh, husband, um, but eventually found him, and he had survived. They were evacuated. Uh, they left the area for seven months. And the thing that really stands out for them in this, in this red here, I can't say anything bad about the way we were treated, but it was stressful, and it was all the uncertainties that made it worse. Now, we studied um, a tornado, a Category 5 tornado that wiped out Greensburg, Kansas five years ago, a farming town of about 1,500 people, Category 5 tornado, about 200 mile an hour winds, completely demolished all the structures in the building, killed a few people, and it was traumatic for the entire community. We called, and, uh, we called folks, it's an interesting story in itself and how we actually access people that are in a town that no longer exists. But we were able to, to contact them, and we interviewed them, and the thing that was by far the most consistent loud aspect of their experience was the uncertainty. Where are my friends going to be? Where am I going to school? We, we, we asked young and old. What happened to uh, the early parts of uncertainties? Who survived? What happened to my house? They, they go up and there is no house. So then the flood of uncertainties come about what goes next, what goes after that. How long are we going to be gone? How long? Now, there's a good story here in that Greensburg uh, redeveloped into a green city. They decided every building was going to be rebuilt with the highest environmentally um, a safe uh, um, materials, and so it was a very good story there, but the uncertainty of that experience was the predominant aspect that came out of those interviews. Now, the second um, story was also a recent, um, but it was a bus accident in this case. It was a really tragic event in the Swiss Alps. Um, a bus filled with kids going to school, school event crashed into a tunnel. 22 kids died. The quote from the dad that they interviewed, we simply do not know if her son is alive or dead, said one parent. The authorities cannot tell us anything. The uncertainty is unbearable, quite unbearable. I cannot tell you how awful this is. He remained behind as a second child while his wife set off for Switzerland. Again, this, what, what is the predominant story here is the uncertainty that comes with this. What's happened to my child? I want to know. In fact, we've talked to people that says, I'd rather know the worst possible news, but I'd rather know that than not knowing. So what we've uh, done as part of this is saying, okay, um, let's try to understand different aspects of uncertainty and the extent to which um, these uncertainties affect our well-being. So we know, for example, that just from these headline stories and from these, um, and, and from these, uh, these other stories, that uncertainty is stressful, obviously. Um, and there are some exceptions. For example, uh, the good news is that uncertainty is hope. If you've been diagnosed with an illness, and you find out that perhaps that um, you know, you, there's a chance that you don't have that illness, that uncertainty brings you hope. Uncertainty is also linked to creativity. Some real interesting studies that say, uh, in fact, it's the people who are able to sort of deal with uncertainty that are the most creative and allows creativity to really foster. So there are positive aspects of uncertainty. But the majority of studies, both of the brain and of physiological responses, and certainly of interviews, say uncertainty is very harmful. So, a couple of studies that we've recently done to kind of show that in community-wide trauma. The first is the wildfires here in Santa Barbara. There was uh, three really devastating wildfires in a year and a half period. And so we called a, uh, we had a community sample and we called the community and asked them, essentially what we're interested in is, um, you know, how does, um, how did the uncertainties associated with your safety, are you going to be safe in this fire? How did that affect your psychological distress? Now, psychological distress are things like worrying about stuff. It's a, it's a psychological part of, of stress. And what we found, not surprisingly, but it confirms it in the context of community-wide trauma, is that those with high uncertainty were a lot more, dis significantly more distressed than those with low uncertainty. So we know, and by the way, there's some really interesting research on the way extent to which media <coughs> make this worse. And so there are th there's a real role for media to help the community by affecting uncertainty. But the second study we did was in, um, in uh, refugee camps in Lebanon. We entered, uh, my wife and I and others, um, uh, planned this project where we went into Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon. Now these, the situation here is, is pretty horrendous. Overcrowding among the most overcrowded places in the world. Poverty out of this world. All the, the aspects that um, place people in promise are there. And so what we were interested in specifically was, was hopelessness. How would uncertainty be related to hopelessness among adolescents? We interviewed adolescents and we gave them surveys. And what we found, again, very similarly, those who were more unsure about their personal safety experienced 
um, much more hopeless, significantly more hopelessness than those that were not. Now, the, the it, good news here, again, is that the level of hopelessness uh, was relatively low across both of them. In fact, one of the things that really stood out to us is the resilience of these kids, and, in, and in really in, a, in what often seems like a hopeless situation. So we know that um, uncertainty is common. We know that uncertainty is stressful. Um, and so we would hope, as a communication scholar, I hope, okay, then we talk about these things. One of the ways that we can become better, that we can deal with these uncertainties, is by talking about them to others. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't happen either. We know from lots of studies in communication, and again in, 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 our, uh, in uncertainty, in fact, we don't talk about these uncertainties. One of your, be your best friends, your partner, your kids, I could have full of uncertainties, could be experiencing a tremendous amount of uncertainty, and you know nothing about it. Why? Because we don't talk about that with others. We let it oftentimes just stew inside us. I'm going to show you a very brief clip of an of a, uh, interview that we did in one of the refugee camps. This is a 13-year-old girl. Uh, I wanted their voices themselves to come out. So you're going to hear it in Arabic, and then I'm going to have an English translation, obviously, on the side. So we'll go ahead and play that. ممكن قلت هي بس بدراستي وضع بالبيت انه بفكر الواحد مستقبله كيف بده يكون لقدام ممكن كل قد ايه كل ما احط راسي على المخدة انا ممكن انه ما احسسك انه اللي قاعد حد ما احسس انه انا مفكر بهالشيء أما أنه نكون قاعدين مثلا أنا وإخواتي أنه بيحكوا شيء ممكن أنا أكون أنا عم بموح عن حالي بضحك وبمزاح بس أنه عشان ما أضغط على حالي وعلى نفسيتي أنه عشان أنه عشان كذا أقول لك أنه الشيء اللي جواتي ما أطلعه لغيري عشان ما يضايق غيري منه. So what you hear here is actually something that um, expressed in a way that for a 13 year old is sad to hear certainly. Um, but the reaction, the fact that she doesn't really speak to others about this, is something that we found across all studies. We looked at studies of, uh, of aging parents and whether we know what they're, um, we're uncertain about what they want for elder care. We don't talk about them. We've done studies of organ donation and whether once we become organ donors, do we talk to our next of kin about this? We're uncertain about how they will react. We don't. So, you know, this is an, a very common reaction across cultures in what we've seen in our, in in our general response to uncertainty. So what I've done so far is I've laid out that uncertainty is harmful, it's common. We also don't talk about it. It lays out a, um, you know, a scenario that is very negative, where the ripple effect of fear and uncertainty sort of overtakes us. I'm going to provide another vision. And that vision is just like the fear and uncertainty can ripple across us, so can the benefits of certainty. So it turns out, that we can actually deal with quite a bit of uncertainty if we're certain about one thing. Just one thing. If we're certain about one thing, and we can manage a host of uncertainties. So what is that thing, you ask? I'm wondering, hmm. That one thing is that the person that you care for the most cares about you. Simple. Reducing your uncertainty, knowing that the person that you love the most loves you, seems to have a tremendously positive effect. In fact, studies of just simple reminders show that reminders that someone loves you makes people more able to um, get through very difficult tasks, less depressed, happier, more self-esteem. The list goes on and on. All they do is remind them. Imagine if you add some actual talk to this story, what it might do. And in fact, some programs, you know, several researchers have looked at this, and our lab is also looking at this, and so what we're trying to do is say, okay, we have this possibility that, this knowledge that uncertainty ripples through, let's make it so that certainty, certainty about this one person ripples through. Now, I, I, you know, thinking back to that day, in uh, May of 1982, <coughs> when I was in the second floor building, uncertainties about where the bombs were falling, 
listening to the echo of that kid in my voice, screaming, we're all going to die. Not sure what's going to happen. Somehow I felt it was all okay. And one of the reasons that I know that that's the way I felt is my parents and my sister were there for me, and I knew it. So what I'm going to ask you today to do is two very simple things. We sometimes think that, um, you know, we can't control a lot of things. We feel that we're not helping, we're not supportive of our closest others. We feel that we can't cure our mom's cancer, or we can't um, certainly bring back a life, or we can't help our children through all the problems. Lord knows we can't do that. And that, you know, good friends are very hurt, and we can't do anything about it. And in some cases, certainly in the cases of life, certainly in the cases of cancer, certainly in various many cases, we can't really repair those. But there's something that we can do that might be just as magical, and that's letting them know that we're there for them, that simple act. So what would I like you to do? I'd like you to do two things. The first thing, think of someone who is very close to you and decide, I'm going to commit to being there for that person. I will commit to being there for that person. Then tonight, after this show, some of you may be with your partners right now, it could be um, calling your parents, calling your mom, calling your dad. It might be texting your best friend. It might be holding your partner's hand. It might be tucking your bed at night and whispering in their ear. It could be calling someone out of the blue that you haven't talked to in a while. Remember, we don't know most people when they're experiencing uncertainty. It could be anyone that's close to you. Commit to being for there for them tonight. Call them, reach out to them, text them, and say five simple words. I am here for you. That's really all it takes. Five simple words. Now, there's lots of ways you can do this. There's lots of ways to express these things. There's lots of actions that you can do. But the bottom line, simple, simple words can work magic. And that's all we need to do. So make that commitment. Reach out to that one or two people that you need and experience the ripple effect. Thank you.